welcome to the Mad Cheese, and welcome especially to the parents, family, and friends, and all of you who really made this day possible. This is certainly a day for celebration. We're here uh, at the MCLI. We've done this for a few year, years now. Actually, that photo of Dr. Constance is from the first year that we were here when he was handing out the, the green envelopes. Last year, it was St. Patrick's Day. So, there we go. Okay, now, uh, you know, down in the, the lower right-hand corner are some words. We're going to say that all together pretty quickly, okay? So are you ready? One, two, three. I wish you a slosh. Did anybody have any trouble with that? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good, actually. Okay, so uh, back in my medical school days, in the, in the mid to late 1970s, uh, times were a lot different. Uh, we're just going to go down memory lane here for a few minutes. Uh, so uh, how many people remember the 70s? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, so there was a lot of social change at that point. Uh, the Watergate scandal uh, was just wrapping up. The first convictions were handed out to Alderman, Alderman Ehrlichman, and Mitchell. President Nixon had resigned, but he had ended the, the Vietnam War, and the Vietnam War officially ended in 1975. So that, that was a good one. Anyway, uh, we got a lot of technological changes that were going back then. So first of all, Anybody know what that is? What is that? That's an eight track. That's an eight track player. And that's a loop blues, right? And so you stuff that thing in that big hole after you installed it in your car and had no room for your legs, right? That's right. But, even, but here we go. This is what really is something. What is that? That's, that is a computer. That is the first personal computer, the first PC. It came out in 1975, that's the Altair 8800. And there was a company that was founded in 1975 too, Microsoft. So it all got off the ground. As a matter of fact, when I was a fellow at the University of Missouri, we had the first PC on campus, and we stuck it in a little bathroom, took off the door, and had a place to put it anyway. That was great. Entertainment. So uh, games were big back then. So here's a game that came out then. Who can solve one of those? Do any of you like to do that? Uh, uh, the, uh, a new game show was started at that, at that time. Oh, yeah. We were fortunate. And you see, it wasn't Pat Jay's take that. Can you see who that is there? Yeah. Uh, and who's with him? Susan Stafford. So Van White didn't come until 1982. So she's had a 36 year run, pretty good as a matter of fact. And then there was TV. What was the number one TV show in 1975? All in the family, there they are. And well, there's one TV show that's still running today that started in 1975. Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah, it's really and then economics. So we're going to have some numbers up here. If you can guess, guess what they are. So here's one number. Ten cents. What's that? Sand. Good. Thirty-three cents. Milk. Milk. Yeah. Well, bread. Well, loaf of bread. Okay. Milk is close. Who said loaf of bread? You got it. Good. Good man. Fifty-seven cents. Yes. Gallon of gas. That's right. Adjusted for inflation, just about what it is today, as a matter of fact. Okay, 5.6%. Unemployment rate, that's right. 11.8%. Inflation rate, think about that. 9.6%. Anybody got it? Cost of a 30-year fixed home mortgage interest rate. Whoa, think about buying something then. And $120 billion? Start. No. <laughs> Health care expenditures. In 1975, the population since 1975 has increased by 50% in the United States. Health care spending has increased by 2,500%. Yeah, it's a lot. We've gone up a lot. Okay. Education. Here we go. <laughs> Count the numbers there. That's the first graduating class at SIU. It's not the first school class. These are the ones who came in at advanced level at SIU under the logo. Uh, the first of SIU's myriad of logos, as a matter of fact. So uh, SIU uh, actually uh, was uh, actually graduating folks in 1975. 
uh, had not yet begun the problem-based learning, but was ready to do all the educational innovations that, that you've seen. But uh, it was uh, an amazing time uh, back then. So uh, I'd say, you know, uh, we're going to go on to the, to the future here. Uh, as uh, you guys begin your residency uh, training programs, uh, there's going to be a myriad of changes, uh, just like the changes you've seen. They're actually going to come faster and faster all the time. You know, they really, really are astounding. Uh, you know, I put this slide up behind me so for the rest of the comments you can see some of the real principles that we've tried to get across here at SIU as you've, as you've come through. But, uh, you know, as you enter this time of change, I think you know that there's going to be an astounding amount of technological change as you move forward. So, uh, I'm going to read something. Uh, this is from the Dean at the New University of Illinois Medical School in Champaign-Urbana. What could the healthcare revolution look like? Dean Lee envisions a scenario that's not really far away, that features delivery drones and an intelligent personal assistant like Amazon's Alexa. Imagine the day you can use Alexa to do a medical interview, he said. Then Alexa makes a provisional diagnosis and said, I need to do these kind of diagnostics. Then a drone will bring diagnostic tools to you. You can put these tools on your chest, put the ultrasound on your belly, it's delivered to you. The data will be collected that will be sent back to an artificial intelligence for analysis. All that data will be presented to the healthcare provider and then they communicate with you, decide the intervention for you, and the drone will deliver the treatment for you. Okay, so artificial intelligence is coming. There's no doubt about that. And I think you're going to need to learn to use tools like that. Uh, that kind of overemphasizes, I think, the technology. The personal relationship between the physician and the patient has never been more important and has never waned. The, the relationship between the physician and the community is actually growing by leaps and bounds as we move forward, too. So uh, I think uh, all this says is we have to really take uh, very good care to remember what we're doing with our personal relationships as we embrace the technology and actually move it down to the patient. It's going to happen. And we have to be able to do that and not resist it. <laughs> because I think it's going to be the best health care for the future. Now, all that also means is that as you move forward, we need significant adaptability. And I think you, your class is amazingly adaptable, and this is why I think so. I've got a concrete example. In 2008, uh, we heard from some residency program directors who said that, hey, we get six, weeks into a six months into a residency, and all of a sudden we find out that our new re some of our new residents will never be able to do critical thinking and clinical decision making to be a good practicing physician. How do we deal with that? So our Department of Medical Education sprang into action there, developed a longitudinal performance examination, which uh, took a look at how we were doing with developing clinical skills. We found some amazing things, one we didn't expect. So clinical decision making increased rapidly in the first year, rapidly in the second year and flattened or actually tailed off in year three when we thought it would increase the most. We had other medical schools do this. Uh, West Virginia Vanderbilt, Medical College of Georgia, New Mexico, uh, Penn State actually, so West Virginia. They all found the same thing. So again, our med ed department sprang into action and started doing studies, a socialization study, a coachability study, uh, a diagnostic justification study, and they came up with a new curriculum a new thing called CCC, which you went through to get your decision-making skills really good by the time you finish the second year. And then we changed the third year so that you could see more patients, not be bothered by lectures, and not be bothered by uh, examinations that counted for a grade. And you could focus on becoming a doctor in 32 weeks of clerkships and 15 weeks of personalized educational experience. You did great with that. Uh, you saw twice as many patients, did twice as many procedures, and uh, the, your score on your senior CCX was one of the highest ever. Your scores on the National Board Exam Part 2 were as good as any, and you passed some of the NBME, NBME shelf exams at the same rate uh, in that five-week interblock there. So that was really an astounding success. And this is why I know you're adaptable. I didn't know this until this summer. But before this curriculum started, and when you knew that we were actually training our faculty to be coaches, 
you as a class develop a, a coachability curriculum and were ready to take the greatest advantage of the change for the future that was coming. And you did it, and you did it well, and we're all very, 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 very proud of you for that. So uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's the biggest message that I have for you today. As you start residency, it'll be another phase of your life that's a really good phase. Uh, you'll be with a smaller group, and you'll be with them for three to seven years. And you'll bond tightly with them, and you'll develop friends for life, just like you have in medical school, but it's a different kind of way. So all I would say to you is uh, bring everything that we've, we've given you here at SIU forward into your residency training program, and uh, that's, uh, that you'll have a great time. Have a lot of fun. <laughs> associated with him. Thank you for letting us be here. It's going to take, I'll, I'll move as quick as I can. My, my plan is to finish a minute before 11 so that you guys can find your loved ones and then at 11 uh, I'll say something, okay? So I'm going to start because it's going to take this long. Pascal, Dan, where's Dan at? Dom, Dominic. Oh, it's out for now. You guys, after four years, you ought to, you ought to know who's next. Where's Alex at? Everybody should know where they fit. Sean. Alex. Cody. Okay, so Cody. Matt, <laughs> Matt, no, Matt Brewer, David, come on. <laughs> you guys know, I know you want an uncle, you gotta wait for Kate, Jennifer, <laughs> Eric, Brian, Fitzgerald, there you are, Jace, Atif, Brandon, Stephanie, over here. You are. Emily, <laughs> Laura. Okay. Molly. Krista, Kylie back over here, Jade, where's Jade, up oh, there she is, Carissa, Blake, Emily, Nick, Other Dom, where, uh, he's in the front room. Other one. There you are, sir. Jack. Suheb. <laughs> Zachary. Where's Zach at? There he is. Ian. Sir. Michael. So what I'm going to ask you guys, you guys go find your loved ones, whatever. I will give the signal here in about a minute. communities, really being within the community, seeing how I can help create programs, nonprofits. So young women, 
and the underserved are really my passion. So that's where I'll be focusing my attention. I am elated. I truly am elated. Dr. Neumeister and the plastic surgery department here are phenomenal and all the team, they're great people to work with. I couldn't be happier to match here. I'm going into plastic surgery. I love the connection that you're able to make with the patient, getting to work with them to um, reconstructively get them back to their um, normal place. Uh, SIU is a great, great place for education. Honestly, learning from so many different mentors, it's great because you go away to different programs and coming back home to Springfield, to SIU, and to Memorial, you can tell that people truly care about who you are as a person and not just your education. And that's on top of an outstanding um, educational opportunities that you have here as well with not only research, clinical experience, patient care, it, it's really all truly fantastic here in Springfield. to SIU, so I'm going to be staying put here in Springfield, and I'm definitely excited about it. I like working with adults with mental illness, especially people who um, have trouble with access to the medical system or people who have a combination of mental illness and substance use disorders. I think it's just been a wonderful learning experience. This is a great medical school. Um, we have a great class full of people, and I really like the approach that SIU has taken in our education. And we've put in a lot of a lot of work to get here today, so we're all very excited. For SIU, I would suggest having a flexible mind, an open mind. It is really going in a progressive direction, which is great. Since I've been here, it's got more and more diverse and it's gotten more and more progressive. And I think that each person of diverse backgrounds can really bring some flavor to SIU. <laughs> SIU, it brought me my husband. I met him my very first week of med school, and that's been the best part about Springfield. I think that's why I ended up here, so I could take him back west with me. <laughs> and they have really loved on me, and I love that it's a small, close-knit school. The class size and the small, close-knit community, it's, it's really great. It's nurturing throughout the journey. SIU is a great, great place to be. And I think that it is so great because, again, they care about you as a person. It is the whole deal. They care about building your character as much as they do educating you to be able to care for those people in the future. And I think that you don't see that nationwide. I mean, we there are so many articles out today about you know physician burnout and everything. And I think what's different about SIU is that we really invest in the person wholeheartedly. And uh, I'm really happy to be sticking around here to be a part of it in the future.